Thank you, Jesus. Man, you ought to be able to clap. You ought to be able to shout. You ought to be able to sing for all that he did for each one of us. Some of us, we could honestly testify, we wouldn't even be where we're at today if it wasn't for what Jesus did in our lives. Let's sing this out to the Lord as we worship him. And let's do this as a testimony of our lives as we serve God. Come on, let's sing this together. Woo! Ah, gracious King. And I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade are never enough. Here we go. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, sing it out. Oh, it's nothing. Better than you, Lord. there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Woo, so true. Come on, so true. Sing it, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to show you my He's the God of the valley. There's not a place. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord.
is going to come go over some prayer requests amen good evening church he's the only one who can amen the scripture tells us this the book of Luke tells us this in chapter 20 verse 38 for he is not the God of the dead but the God of the living that's right we are alive because he is alive. Man. We live because he lives. Only he can do that. Watch Amen. Out. That's the God that we serve, church. Yes. That is the God that we serve. God of the living and not of the dead. Amen. You heard pastor's prayer request. Amen. For the Isaac. grandson's recovering. But he had stroke. Recovery. The other grandfather, the other yeah. side of the family, right? right. right. For Isaac. He's home recovering, but he had a stroke. Amen. So keep him in prayer. Jesus. We also have a prayer request here for Sister uh, Carolyn. Pray for the entire Almaris family. God knows. Amen. Virginia Cruz, please pray for Randy Arellano, waiting for a heart and kidney and lungs transplant. Watch out. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Sister Irene Lopez, pray for the Lopez family. I understand they, they lost a fa uh, an aunt. So mom's, keep them in prayer, sister. man. The mom's sister. Yeah, Jesus. Amen. And personally for me, a, a, a close friend of mine, Ernie Fimbres. Amen. He's in the Beverly Hospital with, of course, you know what it is, that COVID amen. deal. Amen. amen. And suffering from pneumonia also. He's all hooked up. And uh, keep him in prayer. Amen. I, I've known this guy for over 30 years. We're in a home together. We've known each other Boy, for you. Come on. He's a good man of God. Amen. Thank Keep him in prayer. Ernie Fiend breath. Amen. You, we serve a living God. So regardless of what's going around, around us, we need to stand on his promises. Right. We need to stand on what he says, that he is a God of not of the God of the dead, but God of the living. We live because of him. Amen. And he's the only one that could do it. Not anybody else. Amen. We right. serve an awesome, awesome God. Let's right. go before right. the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we come before tonight, Jesus. Lord. Thanking you, Lord God. Thanking you for assuring us, Lord God, that you are not the God of the dead. Hallelujah. But you are the God of the living. Yes. And Father, we live because of you. We live because of what you did on the cross for us, Lord God. We live because of the precious blood that you shed upon the cross, Lord God. And we ask you, Father God, right now that you incline your precious ear unto our cry this evening, Lord God. And as we pray for this prayer request right now that we brought forth, we claim victory, Lord God, because of you. We claim victory because we serve a God that lives. We claim victory because we stand in your promises, Lord God. And Father, we ask you, Lord God, that as the word is brought forth tonight, that our hearts be open, Lord God, and our mind clear to understand what you have for us, Lord. Let it be you that speaks tonight, Lord God. Let your word come forth with power. We give you praise, we give you glory. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody says, Amen and Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Me again. <laughs> I know you're thinking they're not supposed to have so much fun. Well, yeah, I don't know. We should. We should. Anytime we're in the presence of our Heavenly Father, we should be able to rejoice and enjoy His presence. And so hopefully that is what you're doing, a little bit of worship and, and time to spend in the Word. I got a couple of things that I'm going to share with you here, and that is, you know, we're, we're, we're glad things are changing. I, I can hear you say amen 
through through all the media and everything, uh, restaurants have gotten open. Come on, we got to give the Lord some praise for that. I don't know why we like restaurants so. No, I know why we like restaurants so much. I know why. Maybe because we're 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 fed up with just top ramen and all the yeah all those little quick meals we've been doing. Uh, either way, um, that that's that's good, but that's not enough. Okay. Our kids want to be back in school. Our children want to be back in school. And I got to tell you, you know, if you're, if you're listening to the news, they, 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 try not to get, um, they try not to get our ears filled with all the stuff that's going on. But most other states outside of California have already kids already back into school and all that. And uh, I realize if you've been reading and not just listening to the news, you also read that part of it has to do with a lot of the teachers. You know, about a month or so back, maybe two months back, you know, they took a poll on the teachers, and it was almost 90% of them that didn't want to go back because of their fear. Now, they've initiated all the vaccinations, and all that is working well. We hope as that goes through, if you have an elderly parent or a, a grandparent or an aunt or somebody that you know, make sure, especially in their uh, situation, that they can get vaccinated. I know that some of the folks that have already had COVID, if you, if, if, you, if you had it really badly, your body probably already produced a lot of the antibodies and stuff. If you just got a little bit of breeze of it, I don't know. It's up to you. You might consider whether the vaccination might be good for you. But listen, we need to pray and we just need to continue to believe God that, that we can get back to normal. Okay, that's what we want to see. We want to get back to normal families when they can meet. Churches can fellowship. I know churches are still meeting. Social distance, that's a new word that's coming out. And I've never in my whole life seen so many signs of social distance. Not since the 60s. And that times it was against all the hippies. Um, yeah, and so <laughs> yeah, long hairs. Yeah, long, long haired freaky people need not apply. We don't give jobs to them. There's, they made songs about stuff like that. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had those uh, little difficulties and those consequences with masks. I've walked into a store totally forgetting I had the mask and, and watched people freak out like Godzilla just walked in without a breath mint or something like that. And so um, thankfully in a couple of places they brought me a mask. In a couple of other places, it's only happened about three times. Uh, one of the other places, I just made a U-turn, went back out to my truck and got my mask. Amen. All right, well, listen. Let me give you a little 411. It's Wednesday night. This is going to be a good week for you. We're getting closer. Come on, we're getting closer. Getting closer to Passion Week. We're getting closer to Palm Sunday. Passion Week is the week between Palm Sunday and Good Friday. And I know it's really weird. Why did they call Friday good when the Lord was crucified on that day? Well, let's, let's be honest. Because he was crucified, we live. He did a terrible, horrible price he paid, but he paid it because it was the only thing that could ransom your sin and my sin. Nothing, nothing, nothing else, nothing else but the Son of God paying with the one price, which was his precious blood, could salvage us, bring salvation to us, forgive us of our sins, not for a year, not temporarily like it was in the Old Testament, but permanently forgiveness of our sins and redemption in our relationship with a holy father, a holy God, a righteous God that because of our sin prior to the blood of Jesus could not even inhabit or look upon us. So this is a good time uh, for us. It's a good time for you. And I know um, I say this, hopefully uh, getting you to, to realize that, that we're, we're a blessed people. Okay. So um, and, I, and I wanted to share this with you because there's a lot of things that God is doing and I'm hoping that he's doing them in your life. But in this Easter season, there's, there's, a, uh, there's kind of a, um, if, you, if you could, like a motto if you want. Because Easter, every Easter brings two things. Um, East, Easter brings a season of redemption and also a season of resurrection. Jesus redeemed us by being crucified and paying the price on the cross on Friday, three days in the grave, and on the third day, he what? He resurrected. He rose from the grave. And so as we get closer, um, I don't know how you're doing 
on your fasting. If you are, if you're not, it's none of my business. I'm just encouraging you that if you're challenged to do something, do something, be wise, make sure you're doing it because if it's something that you want to do, if you're fighting with your spouse and that's why you're not eating, that's not a fast that's going to help you very much. Heal that up. Heal that up. Get the top ramen and all those things back together. And then you make your decisions, okay? Um, as we get closer here in, in the month of uh, uh, March here, we get ready to step in in a couple of weeks into April. I, I just want to challenge you. Uh, this week may be a little bit different for you. This week you might be doing a Daniel's fast. You might be staying away from meat. A couple of weeks ago, I, um, I had the privilege of preaching uh, at Pastor John Navarro's church. Uh, him and his wife Charlotte and a few of the folks from, from Almani here went with me. And, and he got up and he was testifying about, you know, the fasting. And, and, you know, Big John is like Pastor Pep. Pastor Pep Lopez and his wife Terry are here with us, and he's a cook. I don't know what it is about some of those second-generation pastors back in the day out of uh, Maywood, but he's a cook, and they talk a lot about food. And, you know, I usually don't eat before I preach because it's really hard to, to, to have my stomach going through all that stuff while I'm ministering. But he got up and he began to testify about the Daniel's fast. And he goes, have you ever had soy chorizo? And it's like the last thought in your brain, you know, uh, chorizo. Yeah, it's soy. It's not meat. It's not. It's like, oh, man, I'm going to stop at the market on the way home. And I'm going to grab me some of that. Hallelujah. So. However you're doing that, in, in, in whatever form that you're doing that, do that for yourself. Do it to connect you and to, and to make your connection with the Lord and your intimacy solid. And do it as a blessing to God to draw closer to him. And don't do it for any other reason. It's a very personal thing. Um, our Friday nights are still meeting in different very pla various places. If you get on Facebook Live and you check out our app, uh, or you check out our app even on Tithely, you can find some of the names of some of the leaders that we have here, small group leaders. They meet in different places. Some of them use Zoom. They use House Party. They use a number of different things. And I will tell you that over the next couple of months, a lot of things are probably going to change, even though we're still going to be doing um, a lot of uh, broadcasting on to folks who, who can connect with us. Because I know there's some of you folks that watch us, you don't live in the El Monte area. Some of you folks watch us from real far away, and we're glad. We're glad. We're, we're glad that God has uh, put that on your heart. But we want to we wanna make sure that we stay up to, to beat on everything and be able to handle things that are coming. Uh, I want to invite you to get involved. Call one of those groups. Find out where they're meeting. Find out how to get connected, and you can, you know, uh, join the Bible studies and you can at least be there. I know it's difficult to ask questions. Some of them have locations where, you know, it's, it's, there's enough room for them to meet in the yard and the patio and the porch or things like that. Some of them with a big living room. It is very important that you get some fellowship. It is probably the number, maybe the number two thing within the big three things that are important in the kingdom of God. If you read the book of Acts, they're fellowshipping together. Meeting from house to house was probably on the second part of even salvation was a very, very important thing. It's what bonded them. It's what united them. It's what linked them together. It's what forced them to build relationships with each other. You know, when the Bible says iron sharpens iron, that means sometimes your personality and my personality will throw some sparks. When we may not agree on everything, we don't always have to agree on everything. Right. Just need to be clear on why it is I may disagree or why it is you may disagree. Clarity is more important than having all kinds of agreement. And you see that in the book of Acts. So I want to encourage you to do something to join. Saturday mornings, we have an intercessory prayer meeting from 8 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock right here. I want to invite you to come. We have plenty of room. It's about 20 of us. There's Enough room for a couple extra people to come. Don't stay at home. If the pillow monster has you stranglehold on Saturday morning and that's why you don't get up to pray, then get rid of the pillow on, Saturday, on, Friday, on Friday night and, and you'll wake up early enough, I promise, probably with a stiff neck. When you get here, we'll pray for you and, and the Lord will hopefully get rid of that stiff neck for you. That's a biblical thing, but he'll get rid of that stiff neck for you and, and you can join us. Uh, I, and I know, man, pastor, I wake up all week early. You know, you know what's interesting is that a generation before us, maybe your parents or your grandparents, depending on how old you are, they woke up early 
every day of the week. As a matter of fact, as they got older, I know people my age that go to bed at 8.30 at night. I don't even think I'm home yet, mostly at 8.30 at night. 8.30 at night, the problem is at about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, their eyes go bing. And it's like, whoo. If, if I did that, there'd be a lot of studying, a lot of praying, a lot of, I, my days would be upside down. I'd probably need a nap somewhere in the middle there. I just want to encourage you to join us. Sunday morning, you can come. We have uh, overflow inside our fellowship hall. There are chairs in there. We have, uh, uh, I think it's a 55-inch or a 60-inch television, a monitor that we use. Uh, you can sit in there just in case it gets full in here. We, we have it because we need it, and there's folks who have used it. I just want you to know that it's important for you, if you can, start connecting in a physical sense. You can put your mask on, wear your masks here. Everybody wears their masks here. Once you sit down, you're welcome to take them off. But during the time that when you're walking around and whatever else is going on, we ask that you wear your mask. And we're gonna, we're gonna see some good things coming as things get a little, a little lighter and maybe not so harsh and a little less, uh, a little less complicated. And I think it'll be uh, a great thing. Next week, if you had, if you did get our calendar, I think you can even find it on our Facebook uh, link. If you did look at it, next week is breads and sodas. I know some people, oh, I'm not even, I just know that some people are going to have a real, I'm going to get scolded when I get home from Sister Judy right now. <laughs> Drink some water, get some natural juices. Natural juices? Yeah, you won't die. I promise you, you won't die. And don't add sugar to them. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a, almost a good thing. To, to get your body to kind of get off of some of the things, you know, that you're used to doing. It, it's almost a good thing. Although, I'm not trying to tell you how to be healthy, because the Lord knows that's not my calling. <clears throat> so, listen, just join us. Get involved, do something, let, let the Lord guide you, and I promise you, it will be an incredible blessing for you. Let me, uh, let me talk to you about finances and giving. I want to say thank you, as I always have and I always will, to those of you who have just been consistent on a consistent basis and have been giving to the Lord and have been faithful to the Lord. Um, Jesus, in the book of Matthew, Matthew records Jesus uh, speaking out about things that we, uh, we think we don't understand, but in all reality, we, we do understand. He said these words, he said, uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 19. And right now I'm reading from the New Living Translation. In my message, I'm using the New King James. But he said these words. He said, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal them. Now, we may not know a lot about moths. We may not know a lot about rust, but we know a lot about stealing. For some reason, that is in our fallen nature. And this is what he said in verse 20. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Whatever it is that you in enjoy, whatever it is that captivates and has the ability to hold on to your heart, that is where your investments will go. Now, you and I can honestly figure that out. We can think that. We can tell. If you see somebody driving around in a nice 1942, and I'm really going to mess myself up here because I know nothing about bombs, but a nice old car, and it looks really, really sharp, and it, man, it, you, you, you can almost guarantee that every dime and every penny that person gets, they have to invest it in keeping that car looking nice, especially... If somewhere down the line, they'd like to sell it. This is what Jesus said right after he talked about our treasure, um, where our treasure is. He said, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light, and if the light that you think you have is actually darkness, well, how, how deep? That darkness is. No one can serve two masters. For you will either hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now listen what Jesus said. He said, you cannot serve both God 
and mammon. Now, it's funny that the Lord Jesus would use money. Mammon was coin. It was money. You would think that Jesus would use something that we could interpret it and make it fit into things. But even in his day, it was about money. The Bible says that when an offering was taken, Jesus was watching. And he was watching who was putting what into the basket or the bucket. Maybe it was a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket. I don't know what it was. But he was watching. And the Bible says he watched many who put in from their much money. And in the middle of what was going on, a widow woman came in. An older woman walked up. She put in everything she had. The Bible says it was like, it was like three cents. She put it into the offering. She walked away. Nobody ever heard from her. No one who knew who she was related to. No one knew her name. No one knew nothing, but Jesus saw her. And when he saw her, he got everybody's attention. And he told them, he said, all of you, he told his disciples, all of you gave from what you had. That woman gave from what she didn't have, and it was everything. And for 2,000 plus years, that widow woman has been known, has popularity beyond, beyond any other, whether widow or not, or woman or whatever it is, beyond because of what she did. God sees our sacrifice. God sees everything that you do when you do it for his kingdom. You can continue giving um, in any way uh, that, you, that you still are doing right now on a regular basis. If you need some help, you can ask us right now if you need help. Some of the ladies are in the office right now. There are two ladies that will answer the phone. You can call area code 626 452-1673, ask them any questions. Maybe you have a hard time getting online if you want to start giving online. I promise you they'll help you. You can take your phone and you can text um, G-I-V-E. All you have to do is dial area code 650-985-59. That's 650-985-59. And all you have to do is text the word give, G-I-V-E. Don't ask me how that works. I have no idea, but it works because so far it's few people have used it. And if you want to make it really easy on a regular basis, you can go to our church app. Just do a search for Praise Chapel of Almani. And if you search that up, we have a Tithely app. The church app has the information on there. Push give, follow all the directions. You can do it, have it done on a regular basis. You can do it yourself every time you open it up. You can put it on your phone or your iPad, and then you can do it on a regular basis. However it is, you can join and you can be a part of it. On, on all the social medias, whether it's Facebook, whether you see the tape, taping after, uh, the recording after the video on YouTube, whether you're on Instagram, all you have to do is look for Praise Chapel on our money. We are a good family. We're not perfect. If you are looking for a perfect church, please don't come here because you will be shocked that we are not perfect people, but we are redeemed. And the Lord is transforming us day by day. And if you want to let God do that in your life, this is a good family to connect with Especially now that, the, that the, the COVID fear is starting to dissipate a little bit. It's fading away just a little bit. And I just want to invite you to join us and be a part of that. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your sacrifice. Let me pray a blessing over this before I get into the word together. If you'd like, just bow your heads with us right where you're at, wherever you're at. Father, in the name of Jesus, you have given more to us through salvation and the forgiveness of our sins that there is nothing we could do to equal. Nothing we could do to even compare to the sacrifice that you provided for our salvation, for the salvation of all of mankind. You died for the world, and yet a lot of the world ignores that and, and wants nothing to do with you. Maybe for fear of whatever it is, but Lord, there are many who have a heart's desire to stay connected to you and also have a heart's desire to continue to help the gospel of Jesus Christ to minister throughout the world, locally in their neighborhoods where they live and all the cities surrounding the places where they are active. Father, I pray your blessing on the many families that are consistent in their giving to the Lord and to their local churches. I pray for those, Lord, who have not yet grasped the, the very fundamental power behind your blessing when you're honored with one-tenth of everything. 
In the Old Testament, Lord, every farmer, herdsman, sheep herder, every person who labored, he, he by, by law and by, by commandment, he brought to the Lord what was 10% of everything he had. We are no longer under the law. But Lord Jesus, our hearts fulfill that same commandment because you became Lord and Savior of our lives. We don't have to do anything. Everything we do now, Lord, we do it out of our heart's desire because your goodness outweighs any sacrifice that we make. Lord, I pray a blessing on every household, on every family, on every pocketbook, on every account, on every single person who gives freely and gives abundantly to the kingdom of God through whatever ministry, through wherever it might be in a local church, Father. I ask that you bless them in Jesus' name. And we're grateful for that. Amen. We're grateful for that. And uh, just a big amen for that. Hallelujah. So let me real quickly, if I can, invite you to go get your Bibles. Grab your Bible wherever you're at and get that Bible out. I'm going to open up my notes here and set this thing so it doesn't turn off every two minutes because that's a real important thing. Uh, there we go. Let me set this like this and we will get ourselves ready. Mm-mm-mm. A season of redemption is what we are enjoying right now. A season of redemption and resurrection. Hallelujah. What a great blessing this is. Thank you, Jesus. All right. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me, if you can, to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter number 22. And I'm going to ask that you just kind of hold there for a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something that... The messages in the last couple of weeks have led us to. The last couple of weeks, the Lord put this this theme of transformation and how our lives are to be transformed. Romans 12, 2 says that we are to be transformed by the renewing, by the renewing of our minds. Now, the transformation is a process. And in the process, there's a lot of things that happen. And there's a lot of things that that need to, and I could almost say that have to happen. They will happen whether you like it or not. And one of those things is the area of failure. Tonight, briefly, I want to talk about failure. The process. The process of failure. Okay? Now, we, we, we don't have the ability to know everything. And we, we cannot truly, not that it's impossible, I just don't think, we can't discover our failure and, and, and understand our failure to keep God's law except by, by trying our very hardest and then failing. Let me, let me say that so I'm clear. We, we won't discover, we won't get a revelation. You won't completely understand our failure. You can't be holy. You and I are because of Christ, but you can't be holy. You can't try to be holy. You can't make yourself holy. You can try your very hardest, but what's going to happen is you are going to fail. For good reason, you are going to fail. Let me read you this quote that I get. C.S. Lewis spoke about this failure. So I'm going to read it all the way through so that you can get it. And that's where I got that first sentence from. C.S. Lewis said, We can't discover this process of failure and our failure to keep God's law except by trying as hard as we can and then failing. Unless we really try, whatever we say, there will always be at the back of our minds the idea that if we try harder next time, Okay, let me stop right there. This is what we all do. Every time we fail, we tell ourselves, if I try harder the next time, if I, if I, if I force myself, oh, just, oh, just make it, if I get my, oh, make it, I'll suffer a little more, I'll beat myself with a whip, I'll do something to remind myself. Okay, that's what he's talking about. In the back of our minds, this idea that if we try harder the next time, we'll succeed in being completely good and, and, and okay for God and all right in God's sight. And what that does, in one sense, is that the road back 
To God is a road of moral effort. It's you and I trying. It's our moral effort of trying harder and harder and harder and harder to get back to God and to make our lives good. But in another sense, there's something wrong with that. In another sense, it's not trying. It's the not trying that is ever going to bring us home. All this trying, all this doing everything we can to try and be holy and try and do good, all this trying leads up to a, a very vital moment in which we finally turn to God and we say, you know what, God, you have to do this in me. I can't do this. It's an awesome paragraph that I found on a quote from C.S. Lewis where he says, it takes a while of blunder and realizing you can't do right. You can't make yourself right. You can't even make yourself good. But there comes a time after so much failure that you'll finally cry out to God and you'll say, God, you have to do this. I can't. And you know the funny thing about that? That is such a powerful statement because it's true. When you finally give up, raise your hand and give up and say, Lord, I can't do it. Many times our Heavenly Father says it's about time. Anything that you want to see better in your life, God has to do that. He has to do the transforming. Let me say it again. He must do all the transformation that goes on in our life. Let me read this scripture in 1 Samuel chapter number 22. This is David. When David has, has a, he has a situation. Saul does not like him. He's built a relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And David is out on the run. Um, Saul wants to kill him. He's got word from that. And in verse 1, it says, David therefore departed, verse, 20, uh, verse 1 of chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, David therefore de departed from there, Excuse me, I believe he was, in, he, was in, uh, he was in Gath. He departed from there, and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his, fa his father's house heard it, they went down there to him, okay? David is in the cave of Adullam. He's in a hilly area where there were caves. He's there by himself. Word gets out to his family. His family comes and joins him. And then look at verse 2. And everyone who was distressed, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him so that he became captain over them and there were about 400 men with him. Let, let me, let me uh, let's pray. Father, help us with this message, Lord. Help us with this truth that you're going to bring in. Help us, because failure always makes us nervous, Lord, because it's almost like we're just waiting to fail. We just know it's part of the, part of the, the journey that we're on, but we don't understand the power that's behind what we learn. So, Lord, right now, in this short time together, help, help us to hear the words that come from your voice. That's the voice behind my voice, God. They got to hear your voice, your truth behind, behind my words. In my mouth, they're words, but, it, but from you, Lord, they're truth. And I ask that you speak that truth to each and every one of us right now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. When you look at David's early history, when he was young and he was in the house of Saul, there's some interesting situations that took place there. There were some things that happened that 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 Saul just began to change into this, this animal, and he hated David. The, the women and children were singing songs about the great, the great victories that David had, and they, weren't singing, they were singing about a soldier. They weren't singing about the king anymore, and Saul had a jealous spirit, and, and it rose up. And so David, for fear of his life, David did what most people would do, what probably most of us would do, and that is... He did everything to save his own skin. Whatever it took, David did what he could to save his own skin. So he's on the run. Jonathan loves him. Jonathan let him know that his father was that, at, was that angry and that hateful against him. So David hit the road. 
And when David hit the road, his family connected with him, but not only his family. The Bible says that people that went to meet with him, 400 of them, were, were, was a group of people, a group of men who were distressed, who were in debt, and who were discontented. Now, now, now let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me add this here if I can, uh, because this is real important uh, to understand what it means to be distressed. You know, when you're distressed, things just aren't going right in your life. You don't like your situation. What kind of men were these? These were men in a lot of trouble. Being distressed is something like some of us were, <clears throat> we feel it every now and then if we catch a siren. We catch a flashback of how every time we used to hear it before, we'd either want to run or make sure uh, they can't see us or which way they're coming from. In distress means there was trouble in their life. Now, Maybe you're watching us tonight and you're thinking, yeah, what kind of trouble is that? Well, maybe you don't know the kind of trouble that a lot of us know. But a lot of us had a lot of trouble B.C., before Christ, before we came to Christianity or before we came to Christ. And these men were just like that. They were distressed. They had problems. They had situations in their life. They had situations that there was no way, no, absolutely no way that it could be fixed Unless somehow, some way, there was someone who would step in. Being distressed means you're full of anguish. It means that you're aching in pain. You're, in, you're afflicted, tormented by things that are happening. There's no comfort in your life. You're distressed. You've you're, you, you got a heartache. You, you don't like the way things are. You, can't, you don't feel like you can change the way things are. They're, you're filled with sorrow, and you feel like you're a wretched person. This is a wretched situation, and you're filled with sadness. That's what distress means. David was surrounded by a group of men who were just like us, distressed. They were in debt. I don't think I need to define that one for us. They were in debt. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, let's just say they probably didn't handle their finances real well. Can we say amen? They were probably being chased by the repo guy. He wanted to repo their donkeys and repo their mule. I don't know, their camel maybe. They were in a mess, okay? They were financially in a mess. They probably had debtors. When you read in the scripture, in the Old Testament, you read in the Bible about slavery, a lot of people that were slaves, a lot of them were slaves because they got themselves in debt. And once you got yourself in debt so far that you couldn't pay it, you had to work as a servant, as a slave to the person that you owed that debt to. And that's where a lot of slavery came from in those old days, whether they were, whether they were Jewish or otherwise, that's where the term came from. Now, distress or in debt or discontented. I put a little mark right there, Praise Chapel. Because we know what it's like to be dis dissatisfied with things. You know what it's like, and you can remember when you think back at times when you were just fed up with the way things are. I don't know if you ever got in your life to a place where you said, man, I hate the way things are, I hate the way I am, I hate the way my life is. But these were men, and, and they were dissatisfied, they were discontent, they were unhappy. And when you're unhappy, you're aggravated. When you're unhappy, everybody knows you're unhappy. As a matter of fact, when you're unhappy, most people don't want to be around you. They were displeased, they were, they were resentful, they were impatient and restless, and they were always complaining. Ooh. You know what's funny is that it may have been a couple thousand years ago, but boy, that sure fits now. It sure is relevant to today. So let me take this on a journey if I can. And let me give you a point that I want you to remember. And if you want some notes, they'll put a couple of notes up for you. You can always look onto our site uh, after service and after the, uh, when it's recorded. And you can check the notes that are placed there. But let me give you some points. I only have a couple of them in this message here. Number one, God uses broken things to accomplish his greatest work. I want you to remember that. God uses broken things to accomplish his greatest work. Let's, let's do this. And, and we'll at least get through this part. Let's look at the journey that, that David had to take. Let's look at just David's journey, okay? When David was anointed... 
to be the next king. Remember, he was a young child when the prophet went into his father's house, Jesse, and looked at all the sons, and David wasn't even there. They'd even, they didn't even feel David was worthy of calling to come when the prophet came with his, the ram's horn of oil to, to anoint a king. The father knew what that prophet was there for. They knew who that prophet was. For some reason, and a reason you and I understand, they didn't call David. They thought, that mocoso, he's not going to be king. There's no way. There's no way. He smells like sheep. He thinks like sheep. And that's why we leave him out there. But when, when, when the prophet took a look at all, when, when he took a look at all the sons, even though he's seen some that look really good, God said, no, 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 no. You're looking on the outside. And God told him, I look at the heart. He said, don't you, have an, don't you have any more sons? He goes, yeah, well, yeah. I, he, ooh, man, you. David, they sent word out for him. They brought David in, and God told him that's the one, and he anointed him. David was anointed to be the next king. He didn't even know what it meant. He didn't even understand, because after the anointing and the oil was put, poured over him, do you know what he did? He walked out the door, and he went back to the sheep. He was just a boy. And he was the youngest of all of the brothers. David had no clue, okay? He had no idea that the next several years of his life, the next several years would be years of running and hiding from King Saul. He had no idea that that was the kind of life that he was going to step into, that he was going to be uh, fleeing for his life from Saul. Saul, who was the first king that God made over the Israel, the, is the nation of Israel. God didn't want them to have a king. God told the children of Israel, I'm your king. But they wanted a visible king. And so you know how sometimes God will give you what you want just so you'll learn that that's not really what you needed. Oh, Amen. write that down, somebody. Write, write that down. Somebody got to write that down. I'll forget that. Oh. Mm. Isn't that powerful? I'll probably never remember that again. Oh, Lord. Sometimes God will give you what you ask for just so you'll learn that's not what you really needed. And that's what happened here. Saul had incredible success. He was a successful king because God was all over him. And that, those successes turned into an obsession in his life. And as a leader, he had fallen away from God's anointing, and God had sent the prophet out to anoint a new king that was only a boy. What does that tell you? It tells you that God never does anything in a hurry. It tells you that if God anoints a new king, it could be years. It could be a decade. It could be 13 to 15. Years before he does anything that all of a sudden makes you realize, ooh, 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 God, there was a new king. Where did that come from? Way, way back when God initiated the decision. So maybe David, in his mind, maybe David thought, why am I living a life like a fugitive? I'm the next king of Israel. He knew that. He knew what the anointing meant. Even though he went back to the sheep to be faithful to his father, those weren't his sheep, those were his father's sheep. But he knew that he was anointed to be king of Israel. In his mind, he could have thought that, man, why am I running from this knucklehead guy? I'm the guy. I'm the next guy. Somehow that guy's got to be removed so I can be the guy. He was the next king of Israel. Yet his life was filled with one adversity after another. The prophet didn't tell David, you're, you know, you're going to be in the next king, but sit down, son. Sit down, let me tell you something. You're going to go through hell. Oh, David, it's going to be bad. You're going to be on the run. You're going to be public enemy. Number one, FBI is going to be looking for you. I don't know how you put that into words, man, but I tell you, it's, this is going to be. So his life was filled with one problem after another, one adversity after another. Before he ever fulfilled the ultimate calling that God had for him, he would almost, you would almost say, that was a miserable life. Now, other people began to hear of David's success, okay? And they began to identify with his trouble. They began to identify 
with his difficulty. They began to identify with David in realizing that, that the Lord picked him as king, but whoo, homie's got some issues. I don't know. I don't know. Should you follow somebody like that? Well, I think I could because I relate. See, we relate when there's failure in somebody's life because all of us have failed. All of us have failed. But it wasn't the successful, polished people that came out to follow David. It wasn't the, it wasn't the people who lived in the nice houses on the other side of the Metrolink. Oh, I'm sorry. On the other side of the Camel Link back in David's day. I don't know what it was. There were good people and bad people. There were people that you could tell were nice people. And there were people that you can tell that lived in the ghetto. These were the people that came to David. Not the successful. Not the polished. Not the ones that had all the perfect life. Not the one that had all the perfect robes. Not the ones that were all cleaned up. The Bible says those who were in distress or in debt or discontented. They would be the ones that would be part of his army. And what an army it was. David's army would become known throughout the known world at that time as the greatest ever that were put together and that were assembled. And it wasn't because of their skill but it was because God was behind David's army. Listen to me. God was behind David's army, and they were recognized because of God. Not because they were the best. They weren't the best. Not because they did everything right, because they definitely do everything right. It almost, you would almost think, oh, it's like people tell you, yeah, you went to church. You went to church because your life was all jacked up. That's right. That's why I came to Jesus, because my life was all jacked up. I'm going to tell you something. You almost cannot come to God unless failure has been one after another in your life, because you realize, I need him. I need him to put order in my life. I need God to bring healing to my life. I need God to straighten out some things in my life. The biggest problem that happens to a lot of people is they come to the Lord so that he can start that, but they don't stay long enough. They don't stay long enough to let God finish his work. Well, when is he finished? When you're no longer here and you're in eternity with him. That's when it's done. That's when the battle's over. That's when the war's done. That's when you get a victory crown and you can do your little victory dance and all that kind of stuff. That's when it happens. But until then, it's still a war going on down here. Okay? God and God's blessing was why David's army and David's men were known. They weren't the smartest they weren't the ones with all the education. They didn't drive the fine camels with, you know, spinners on their hoofs or whatever they call them. They didn't have all the things together. They weren't the, the, they weren't the best dressed. They weren't the immaculate. They weren't the best uh, speakers, but they were anointed by God to do whatever war that would wage against David as king. And God anointed them and people recognized that and they were praised for that and they were well known for their victory. Go to the New Testament with me if you can. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 if you can. Let's see if I can do this here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Nope, I must have lost it here. Let me turn there if I can. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And uh, if you can, go to, just go to, the first, let, uh, let's, let's see if I can do this. Jump down to verse number, uh, verse number 18. Let's, we're going to jump around a little bit. Let me see if I gave them to you the way I have them here, sis. Yeah, starting in verse number 18. Follow with me. I'm going to jump a little bit. Starting in verse number 1, verse number 18. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to the church at Corinth. Okay, let's, let's get through this because our time is clicking away. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. In other words, God is saying, I don't celebrate what man does on its own. I celebrate what I can do through my sons and daughters. Verse 20, where is the wise? The apostle Paul is saying this. Where, where are all the wise people? 
Where's the scribe that knows? The scribes were the ones who would write down all the things. Scribes were the ones that wrote down all the old, all the parchments and stuff like that. They were like the the uh, uh, advanced executive secretaries of of the Pharisees and the and the. Uh, 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 children of Israel. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer? Those are the people who could speak up and give a good argument. You know, they were like they were like the people who could give a good reason. The Bible says we ought to have always have a reason for the hope that you have. You should have a reason and know how to answer for people who would say, why, why do you serve Jesus? Why do you love God? Why do you follow him? Where's the disputer of this age? And then he said this, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? I want you to jump down to verse 26. Verse 26, Paul tells them, he says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen, hold on to your hats, hold on to your hats, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base, the base, the bottom, you know, the bottom things like, you know, when, when, when the Lord found me, I tell people he didn't just find me on the bottom of the barrel. He had to move the barrel. I was underneath the barrel. The base things. He said the base things of the world, the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of God, wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Verse 31, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. If there's anything good in my life, it's God. If I do anything right, it's God. If I say anything that, that, that astonishes you, whoa, that's awesome, it's God. There's nothing good in this flesh. There's only God in me, and when it's good, it's always God. Always God. Go to chapter 2 real quick. Listen, Paul. Listen again to Paul. And, and I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellent speech. I didn't come with, uh, or, or, or of wisdom declaring, you know, to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in meekness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching, they were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That what God does in your life should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Everything good, everything awesome, everything that's worth credit is all given to God. So God turns, turned David's men, go back to David in the Old Testament, God turned David's men into mighty men of valor, the Bible says. You can see 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse number 10, where they became known, their, their family, their names, they, the, the, they were chiefs over their, over, their, uh, over their families, and they became known as these very valiant men, very honorable, honorable men, but it wasn't because of them, it was because of God. All right, last thing, last thing. Number two, God often uses failure to make us useful. And I know that's, that's like, well, you know what, Pastor, that's... That's a, that's a malfunction there because how does that happen? When Jesus called the disciples, he didn't go out, he didn't go looking for the most qualified. He didn't go out, Jesus didn't go out looking for all the successful people. He found the most willing. Did you hear that? He found the most willing and he found them where? Working. All of them in their workplace. He found the fishermen fishing. Mending their nets. They were probably complaining because their nets were torn and that was a pain and they had to sit there and refix them just so the fish couldn't get out when they went fishing again. They were working. Say working. Working. He found the tax collector sitting at his desk collecting taxes from everybody. They hated him. 
They despised tax collectors, especially if he was Jewish and he was taking a tax for the, from the Jewish people to give to Caesar, and, and, and that was even worse. That was the worst testimony you could have. That would be like a shark who loans money in the neighborhood and everybody hates him. He found a tax collector. He found fishermen fishing the tax collector at his um, desk, and he found farmers working in their field. The Hebrews in the Old Testament, they knew that failure was part of a maturing in God. This is why when you and I read the Old Testament and all the things they went through, one of the things that they, that, that they legitimately had to do is their adversity and their failure brought maturing into who they were. So much so that sometimes the maturity had to let one generation go by so the next generation could get it. Okay? The Greeks used failure as a reason for disqualification. There's a big difference there, okay? What's really sad about it is that today in the church, the church is kind of like that. We often treat one another like that, okay? We, we often treat each other like that, that when somebody fails, we automatically in our mind think they're disqualified. Man, if that was true, none of us could serve God. If that was true, none of us could be here. I'll give you a good example because the Apostle Paul, when he first got saved and he started to serve the Lord and he started to be obedient to God, the Lord had to slowly but surely over time, over years, God had to transform him. I kind of shared that last week. I'm not going to go through it again. But here's the Apostle Paul, and him and, 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 and uh, uh, Barnabas are going out on the first missionary trip, laid hands on them. They launched these, these two gentlemen out, these two brothers in the Lord, powerful preachers, and a young man by the name of John Mark goes with them. And after a few weeks, guess what? Fails. He doesn't want to be with them anymore. He doesn't want to stay there anymore. He doesn't like it that they sleep in the Motel 6 and they don't sleep in a good hotel. I don't know. Behind the bushes, on the floor, whatever it was. And when he had the chance, he went home. In Paul's mind, he was disqualified. How do you know that? Because later on in the Acts, when Barnabas regroups and says, we're going to go out again, and, and I'm, going to take, I'm going to take young John Mark with me again. And Paul says, no, you're not. Yet he's been here two years. He's doing good. Paul said, I don't care if he can fly. I don't care if he has angel wings. I don't care if he shows a halo around his head. He's not going with me. And the Bible tells us that conflict happened and it separated those two men. Later on down the line, as God works in the process of Paul's life, Paul realizes that God can take a failure. <laughs> that God can take a failure, a big failure. He was such a big failure that letters were wrote to the churches about his failure. He was such a big failure that he was known for the guy that caused conflict between Barnabas and the, and the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And it separated them. And it was so bad that it separated them. So what do I mean by all this? And this is just the beginning. I'm going to finish this on Sunday morning. I got another part to this area of failure. God's way is not through disqualification. Failure does not disqualify anybody, and I don't care what kind of failure it is. I'm here to tell you it does not disqualify you. What disqualifies you is when you quit. When you quit, God can do nothing, and I can do nothing, and others can do nothing because it's your choice. And God gave you and I the freedom to make a choice. That incredible love that God has for all of mankind, sinner or saint, saved or not, is the freedom to make choices in your... If you don't want him, you don't have to have him. If you don't want to spend eternity in heaven, you don't have to spend eternity in heaven. If you don't want deliverance or forgiveness or anything, you can make that choice. He will not violate that choice. He put Adam and Eve in the garden and gave them the freedom to choose. God looks for your availability before he looks at your abilities. He's going to consider whether your heart is open and inviting him. We need to understand that failing does not make us failures. Let me say it again. Failing does not make us failures. You know what it makes us? Experienced. There's a word, folks. 
There's the word for those of you that are watching, for those of you that are here, the few that are here. There's the word right there. Failure does not make us failures. It makes us experience. It gives us the ability to tell somebody, hey, bro, hey, sis, I've been through that. Oh, I did that. Oh, it was ugly, and I learned. And you might have to learn that on your own because I can tell you not to, but you might do it anyway. It makes us experience. It makes us more prepared to be useful in the kingdom of God. If we've learned from it, right? If we've learned from it, we must learn from our failures. It is such an important thing that when we fail, that we have moments of understanding where it took place, what we, what we slacked off on, what we ignored, how we didn't prepare ourselves, all that is important stuff for us to get because that's where we learn. And that's the most important ingredient for what God wants in his children. He wants us to learn. He wants us to grow. He wants us to have experience. And he wants us to trust him. But you can't do that unless you realize that one of the processes of it is failure. Close your Bibles for me if you can, where you're at. Put your uh, notes away that you're taking, and I want you, if you can, just to stand to your feet with me or where you're sitting, wherever you're at. Just bow your heads where you are at, and we're just going to pray tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, there's so much in your word, so much in the words of the authors who wrote things in the Bible, God, that, that speaks to us in the area of failure. Lord, we live in a world where we, we, we make it such, such an issue that even not realizing it, we see failure as a disqualification in people's lives. And yet all of us are failures, God. Lord Jesus, we can't even come to you for forgiveness unless we acknowledge we failed. It's like a given with us. We're broken. Some of us in, in, in smaller pieces than others, but we're all broken. Father, help us to understand this journey of the process of you bringing maturity into our lives and helping us to grow and in the process of that, using failure to make us useful. Help us, Lord, so that we're not so afraid of it. Because some of us, some of us are more afraid of failure than almost anything else. We grew up in houses and households determined never to show pain, never to let others know where we failed. And now we come to you, Lord, and in all reality, what you look for is our hearts that will be open to confess and say, man, we blew it. I've messed up my life. Lord, help us as we pray this prayer of forgiveness together. Would you pray this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, help me right now in my life. I thank you for all that you did on the cross of Calvary. The help I need is forgiveness. Forgive me of my sin. Lord, I confess that I can't do things on my own. I can't do anything positive unless you help. I'm just as broken as everybody else. But I realize now that you use broken things. And Lord Jesus, you take broken people and you put them through the process of transforming them, healing them, and fixing and mending their hearts. Lord, take my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me in your righteousness. I thank you for your truth that sets me free. Help me endure the process. I rebuke the fear of failure. I rebuke the condemnation of the enemy. Help me to walk in your light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. It's all right. You can give the Lord a hand clap. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, God 
is giving us some great insight and we're going to use this. I'm saying this to you because uh, Sunday, we're gonna go a little bit further with this. We're going a little bit further on the area of whether failure is optional. You don't have a choice. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that on Sunday morning. Join us Sunday morning. Join us in all those information that I gave for you, Friday nights, Saturday morning and prayer here. Cut out as you can, get rid of the fear little by little and come join us. It'll be good to see you as we celebrate together all that God is doing. God bless you, have a great evening and we'll see you on this weekend.